Well, it took 29 days, hundreds of leaders' events, and hundreds of thousands of doors knocked on, but we're finally here. Ontario's 43rd general election campaign will end tomorrow, and we should know by a little after 9 p.m. Eastern time who will form the next government. For many candidates, this is just their first or second grand consultation with the people, which is why we thought, let's get some people in here on this last day of the campaign who've seen, well, let's say more than their share of campaigns. And so we welcome, in order of precedence in the last house, John Snowblin, former PC cabinet minister, first elected in 1995. He's in Georgetown, Ontario. In Restool, near North Bay, Senator Francis Lankin, former NDP cabinet minister, first elected in 1990. In Prince Edward County, near Picton, Greg Cerbera, former Liberal cabinet minister, first elected in 1985. And in Guelph, Carolyn Pickett, the Green Party candidate in Glengarry Prescott Russell in 2007, who very much wishes she had made it to cabinet at some point, but alas, did not. But that doesn't diminish from the fact that we're happy to have all four of you here with us tonight here on TVO. And Senator Lankin, whenever you're on this program, we have to do this in the interests of full disclosure right off the top. Uh, do you know somebody uh, who may or may not work for you who has a last name that is eerily similar to mine? Eerily similar. And sometimes he also goes by the first name Mark, but usually Henry. <laughs> that is true. My kid works for you. Okay, there we go. Um, well, let's have a little fun here. John Snowblin, once upon a time, was the Minister of Education in the province of Ontario, and he looked something like this. Sheldon, if you would. So I like to say that uh, in those days, not very long ago, when Betty Stevenson was the minister, our job in education was to prepare young people for the future. And now we have an additional burden as educators to prepare the future for our young people. And so uh, it's a different burden, really. So the first question is, don't we both look so much better today? No, that is not the first question. <laughs> The first question is, uh, what, what was this election about anyway? Well, that's, uh, that's been the big question for 29 days. Uh, you know, I, I think that the political parties are oddly detached from where people are. I, I, I know probably like my colleagues uh, tonight on this panel, that, you know, we've been going door to door. And the big issue for people is affordability. It's the dominant, it's kind of like, you know, when the alligators come in the pool, you quit thinking about swimming and everything else is on the side. And, and, and right now, you know, it's $2 a liter gasoline and the food prices, and that's the issue. And, and to the extent that political parties have spoken to it, they can connect to people. If they don't, they can't. Hmm. Once upon a time, Frances Lankin was a cabinet minister in Ontario, and she was a pundit on a previous program we did together on TVO. And that went something like this. Sheldon, again, if you would. What's happened in the last week has been really fascinating as uh, the Conservative campaign has gained popular ground, which it has. No one can deny that. In fact, it's not a horse race at this point in time. Uh, they're in the lead. Well, we talked about elections then. We're talking about elections now. What do you think this campaign's been about, Senator? Uh, well, I would agree with John in terms of uh, where people are at. Now, I, I don't go door to door uh, anymore. I'm an independent, so I don't uh, engage in partisan politics, but I'm surely a keen watcher. I, I have found this election to be um, lackluster, uh, boring, frustrating, and uh, I, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, some of the issues are the issues that we've talked about in every election for I don't know how many decades. And I'm frustrated that we're not making progress. But the other thing I would say is that, you know, the issue of the economy, John's right, that's, you know, costs, uh, how we're going to get through this is on people's mind with all the weight of the post-pandemic um, anxiety and polarized politics. Uh, but it, that's not something that a province in and of itself can fix. So there's a mismatch between, um, you know, a buck of... Uh, uh, bus ride, sorry, <laughs> buck a bus ride. And, you know, the actual stuff that is um, is worrying people and what will fix it for people. So there are limited tools the province has, I get that. And I think that shows through in terms of the uh, commitments that the parties are making right now. Once upon a time, Greg Sorbera was the finance minister in the province of Ontario. Sheldon, if you would. This statement really says is that we've got a serious but manageable fiscal problem and that we're going to work our way out of it and we're going to ensure that we have the capacity to deliver on those improvements in public services. There you were talking politics 19 years ago and here we are again. Wow. What do you think this campaign was about? 
Well, I, I think it's simple, Steve. I think the question is, does the Doug Ford government deserve re-election? And I think, uh, to me, that's the ballot question. And uh, I think the answer is absolutely not. I mean, we have a crisis uh, in uh, uh, we have a crisis in our housing industry. We have a crisis in our healthcare system. We have a crisis in education. Uh, I remember in the last election, in the midst of the last election, Doug Ford said, "We are going to put an end to hallway medicine." Uh, three weeks ago, a dear friend of mine's mother was committed to hospital. And she spent the first four days in the hallway. What happened to that promise? Uh, and we have a crisis uh, w with our seniors and caring for our seniors. And as the other said, we have a crisis in the cost of living. And when you add on the inflation that is now infecting the economy, uh, affordability becomes an even greater problem. And there's nothing uh, that the Ford government is promising to do anything about that. So. Uh, I'd say, look at the record. It's not a good record. In fact, in almost every area of public service, it's an abysmal record, and that government does not deserve to be reelected. More on that as we continue our conversation, but let's once again... Uh, Carolyn, I'm sorry, I have no tape of you from your time in Cabinet in the Government of Ontario once upon a time, but I do have some tape of you four years ago when you were on this set, and you were the Green Party representative talking about the time in 2007 when you ran in Glengarry Prescott Russell, and you mm -hmm. told us about that on election night four years ago. Sheldon, if you would. When I ran there in 2007, the Liberal incumbent had an arena named after him. There was no, no way that he was not going to win. In fact, the news of the night is that I came in third and came in ahead of the NDP. That's what the journalist <laughs> that called me said. That's the news it? of the night. So that was the news of the night four years ago. What's the news of the night this time for you? Well, the news of the night is that um, Mike Schreiner has established himself as a professional politician with integrity. Uh, he has been able to work across party lines as we expect him to. And he's demonstrated that he will vote in favor of bills that are in line with our values, regardless of who puts it forward, will not oppose it just for the sake of opposing it, but also able to craft uh, a bill that can gain uh, four party support. So for us, this election, uh, of course, we're hoping that uh, people uh, in Perry Sound, Muskoka will uh, continue with their, their um, vision to uh, hopefully change things over there, bring Mike some company at Queen's Park. Uh, it's um, it's the it's the we're the only party that's that's has new solutions to old problems at this point. As the others have said, it's been a lackluster campaign, no bold ideas coming from any of the three old line parties. And so we're just trying to get our message out. And now that Mike Schreiner's been able to participate in the leaders debate, he's been able to, to chip away at that um, lack of representation. All right, let me follow up on that word lackluster, because I've heard it twice now from two of you. And, um, okay, John Snowblin, start us off again. What, did, what, what about this campaign has been lackluster in your view? Well, for, let me say first, I liked all those clips except the one with me and you. Uh, <laughs> but, Greg, I, I have to vote for you in a minute. Just keep signing up. But, but I would be careful about how you use the word crisis. It can come back and bite you every now and then. I just, just a little caution on that one. Uh, the, Wait, you know what? You really uh, do need to explain that because that happened mm -hmm. uh, tw tw 27 years ago and a lot of people won't remember that. But, <laughs> but I was hoping a lot of people wouldn't remember it. You, you did say, as education minister, we're going to have to try to create a crisis here to give you the cover to make the bold <laughs> decisions you wanted to make. So that's that reference. Anyway, the floor back to you. It, in any of it, uh, I think lackluster means that people haven't connected with uh, with this election cycle. It comes at the end of the pandemic. It comes at a time when people have, have finally uh, started to live their lives again. And as they've done that, they've found themselves constrained by the rising cost of everything. And I, and I think uh, Greg was right. I mean, this is a global global deal. This is this is certainly a national issue. Uh, and so, rightly, there's a problem with policy at the provincial level uh, in addressing that. But 
understanding people's anguish. You know, that they, they've had their families locked up for two years. Their faith in public institutions is probably at an all-time low. And now they're facing all of these problems in terms of affordability. To connect with them at, at the level of caring was the issue, I think, for Doug Ford. And I think he he got that done because just because of Doug's style. I mean, he 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 can translate that. He is that. Uh, he cares about people and it shows. That doesn't mean everyone else doesn't. But he, but 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 Doug is very very good at connecting with people, and I think that's happened for for uh, you know 28 days now. Uh, lackluster because I don't think that there are ideas out there that have ignited the public imagination, and that's never on the public. That's always on us, those of us in political parties, whether you're an old political party or a new political party. It's our job to ignite the public imagination, and that really has not happened. Well, Senator Lincoln, given all of those caveats that John Snowblin just put on the record, was there anything any of the parties could have done to be more, if I can sort of use your word, to be more lustrous in this campaign, or was it destined to be lackluster? I, I think in some ways it was destined to be lackluster. I mean, if you think of some of the ideas that would um, excite a certain segment of the voters and you know someone like myself would be um, excited by the vision issues like pharmacare and child care are really important except that that's been overtaken in time by the uh, the federal scene and the fed prov negotiations around child care for example we have ten dollar a day child care coming to ontario we have a federal government that is uh, working with provinces and bringing forward an approach for a canadian um, Pharmacare. So those are big ideas and they're important ideas, but they can't break through people's everyday um, struggle right now. And I, I think John's right to bring this down to the personal. And while I think that Doug Ford is very good at connecting with people at the personal level and during the pandemic with all the missteps, and uh, you know, all of the things that um, I, I, I wish I could agree with Greg that the ballot box question is, does he deserve to be reelected? Because I've got a really easy answer to that, but that's not what's on people's mind. They felt a sense of comfort. They felt a sense of being taken care of. They could tune in every day. Um, I don't believe he's connected with hardly anyone in the last 28 days, John. I mean, you know, part of the lackluster, we don't have a premier answering questions. And I don't think, um, you know, with a lot of uh, respect, I'm just meeting you, Carolyn, it's not old line parties. The Greens have been around as long as I've been around in politics. No. Um, you know, I watched the, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. No, they haven't. Yes, they have. The party. I've, mm -hmm. I've sat 27, 20 plus more than that years ago um, in all candidates uh, debates with Greens. But anyways, uh, the lustrous, I, I want to feel a sense of excitement and vision for the future. I think that that's hard to do, Steve, when we're still in the post-pandemic you know, just emerging. I think people want to be excited about what life can look like, but there are too many questions about affordability, about the future of their kids. So part of it is destined, and part of it um, was none of the uh, the leaders, with the exception perhaps of Mike Schreiner, but he doesn't get the kind of attention at this point in time, um, mm -hmm. have been putting forward something that feels um, more, more visionary and feels mm -hmm. like a, a newer combination. And that's probably because the other leaders, um, you know, in with Del Duca's case, it was in cabinet, but we've heard them before. Um, yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to mention, God bless her, you know, Andrea um, and Mike with, you know, COVID and, you know, those sorts of things. There was a lot of stuff. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but a lot of stuff <laughs> conspired to make this a lackluster campaign. <laughs> I'm just looking up online right now. In fact, the Greens first ran candidates in Ontario elections in 1985. So they Correct. have been around for a long time. But, but okay. not as long as the NDP. Uh, or, or the others. That is a fact. That is a fact. Okay, Greg, you heard some criticism there. You want to pick up on any of that? Well, yeah. I mean, I don't think it was a lackluster campaign. I, and maybe it's just because of the area that I used to represent in, uh, in York Region, in Vaughan and King and uh, Newmarket and Aurora. There's a huge question there. Uh, should the province of Ontario, the 14 million of them, spend $10 billion building a highway that will mm -hmm. destroy a part of the green belt, that will provide a little bit of ease for maybe 50,000, 60,000 drivers who live in that area? I think it's just an awful, awful 
uh, approach and an awful, Absolutely. awful uh, issue of public policy. It's just it should not be done. Uh, or, as Stephen Del Duca suggests, should that money be spent on rebuilding schools, rebuilding hospitals, hiring more teachers, hiring more nurses, rebuilding our infrastructure? Uh, I just read the other day that Austria, uh, which is a leader in, uh, in, in greenhouse issues and climate change issues, just canceled eight highway projects. We should, in this election, tell Doug Ford that we ought not to build that highway and we ought to spend that money in ways that help the vast majority of 14 million Ontarians. Well, Carolyn, so it's not lackluster for me yeah. at all. I, no, I hear you. And, and Carolyn, yeah. the Greens have put that message forward. The NDP, the Liberals have put forward the idea that the yeah. 413 is an unnecessary and dumb highway to build. And yet, for whatever Absolutely. reason, it, but it has not captured, sorry for the use of this word, the zeitgeist uh, among the population <laughs> right now. And, and has not inspired the electorate to sort of get out there with their picket signs, no pun on your last name intended, and do something about this. Why not? Right. Well, there's a couple... I mean, there is actually very, very strong opposition at the municipal level uh, to that highway, if you look in the, the area of Halton Hills, uh, et cetera. Um, but we are tired. The pandemic has taken its toll. Um, I know that for myself, with a young child and a full-time job, we are just trying to keep our heads above water, and um, there's not a lot of energy and time left, unfortunately, for those very important issues. Um, that's why it's so important for us to have green voices in the legislature, regardless of how many there are, uh, because we need at least one person that is going to bring those up on our collective behalf. Um, and yes, the affordability is the, the election issue, um, and we haven't heard anything, uh, in my opinion, other than from Mike Schreiner in terms of truly addressing that. So we look at the housing policy that the Green Party has put forward, um, you know, the Toronto Star, that we're not just proposing to increase taxes or increase build houses. Uh, we've got a full suite of of policies to address that. Well, okay, it's I get you. Uh, okay, it's well, difficult to put, put it forward, but okay, we're, but we're saying one of the it things anyway. I'm, I'm going to jump in here because one of the things I did not want this conversation to turn into is everybody just sort of defending quote unquote yep. their color okay. in this election. And, and, you know, we've had 29 days of listening to what all the platforms are. And, you know, you say nobody's done anything about affordability. I mean, clearly, every campaign's had something to say about affordability. You may not like what they've had to say, but they've all tried. And yet, and uh, John Snowblin, I'll pick up with you here. You know, uh, I don't know what you think about the 413. I mean, it's pr probably going to be built fairly close to where you are right now. But, uh, I was going to say, of the people we're talking to, I, I mean, I could look out this window and, and see where the 413 is going to end. Exactly. And I wonder, and, as a former know, minister of natural resources, whether you think it's a good idea to build it. Well, it's been a debate for a long time. And I can tell you this, that uh, I think Doug Ford's quite happy and his candidates are quite happy to have that debate because the people who are stuck in cars and stuck in traffic and idling along every morning wants more highways. They want some brick. They want bricks and mortar in this province. They want hospitals built and they want schools built and they and they want that kind of let's move forward and let's build again. So I, I think there's a there's a uh, you know there's there's obviously a, a large number of people who want to get that infrastructure built and there's some people who don't want to have it built. That's never it's never been any different whenever you built anything. Uh, but but I think Ford is quite happy to make the argument for the 413. Um, the the and I think it's a good argument. That, by the way, the, living this close to it, the the issues of affordability and those other things that matter to people on their streets and their neighborhoods right now, right today. What's interesting to me is the disconnect between the political narrative, particularly at the top of this writ period, and those concerns. How was it that that uh, the political parties, by and large, didn't get the message that people were over the pandemic and that they were very concerned about these these issues uh, and, and that that was the underlying issue for this campaign. That was not the narrative that, that uh, Stephen Del Duca tried to come out with. It wasn't the narrative that Andrew tried to come out with. 
So how did they get that disconnected from the electorate? Hmm. Got any theories about that, Greg Cerbera? Well, yeah, I, I, I think it, uh, there is a possibility that people are just uh, really exhausted uh, when it comes to public policy issues. We recently had uh, a federal election, and it was an election that nobody wanted and nobody really cared about, and it didn't change anything. So there is a fatigue uh, right across right across the spectrum, uh, mm -hmm. and people uh, are tired uh, as a result of the pandemic. However, uh, you know, an election is a time to re-examine uh, where we want to go and what should be the priorities of uh, the 14 million people that make up the population of Ontario. So, I mean, look, uh, you can have a variety of different views. I am just hoping. I mean, if I have any message, it's the day before election. If I have any message at all to the people of Ontario, please, please get out and vote. Look at uh, the candidates in your area. Think about the issues and make up your mind because the worst thing that could happen is that we have a very low turnout. I just don't, I hope that is yep. not the case. Hmm. Senator yeah. Lincoln, let me pursue something with you, which um, with the increasing Americanization of our language has come to be known as the progressive primary in this season. And that is the notion that Doug Ford wins when liberals and new Democrats fight against each other as much as they try to fight to replace him. And we have seen it really increasingly loudly in the last few days of the campaign uh, where I saw Andrea Horvath introduced this morning and the candidate who introduced her up in Brampton uh, had more negative things to say about the Liberals than she did about Doug Ford and the need to replace Ford. It was make sure, you know, not only defeat Ford, but make sure the Liberals don't get back in too. Uh, the Liberals have been doing a lot of campaigning and ridings that were formerly held by the NDP as opposed to the Tories. And, I, you know, I, I guess I want to know uh, how... How are you ever going to get rid of the Conservatives if the Liberals and the New Democrats are fighting each other as much as the government? Um, well, this is this is no offense to you, Steve, but what I said is that some parts of this campaign are boring because, you know, we've heard it over and over and over again. Um, you know, there are elections that I participated in 30 plus years ago where that question was asked. And, you know, every election is different and every um, set of ridings has some flow to it. And, you know, I, for years, uh, was in a riding that was a Tory NDP riding. And um, it wasn't until much later that it became an NDP liberal riding. So things do change. And there, you know, there's a competition there. Uh, there have been times when the circumstances and the public policy issues of the day and the leadership of the parties have drawn the Liberals and the NDP to say, is there an approach? And, and may I say, and not to leave the Greens out, because that has happened too, and I think, you know, uh, particularly federally on, on some things. Currently, federally, we see the Liberals and the NDP um, working to stabilize a minority government. Um, these things can be done, but there's a particular animosity in Ontario between those two parties. I remember, um, you know, there were years when I would say I would support a progressive conservative, a progressive conservative, not a populist conservative. Um, before I would support a liberal, and and you know uh, there were there were uh, progressive uh, blue conservatives who said the same thing. So uh, all of this to say that um, those are those are sort of you know uh, questions for the future. If the numbers produced, which it does not look like it will do, but produced a minority government, those two parties would have to sit down and decide, not because of keeping an eye on their political future. That would be the wrong reason. It would be because uh, together they could accomplish something that they believed was important, both in terms of public policy, but in terms of a change of government. And, uh, you know, let me tell you, I have a lot of respect for Andrea Horvath, and I believe that if she were in that circumstance, um, she would sit down and do that. But you know, to ask her that question now or to ask Steve Del Duca that question now, uh, it, it's it's hypothetical and it's it's not a fair question. We'll see when we see. No, for sure. And and uh, I, I guess, uh, Greg, I'll go back to you on this one, because in 1985, that's what happened. Your first election, the second place liberals and third place New Democrats had the majority of the seats, even though the PCs technically won the election. And the Libs and NDP ganged up to kick the Tories out. And David Peterson's government, which you were a part of, took over. I guess I'm wondering... Do you think going forward, if in fact Ford wins a majority tomorrow night, that liberals and new Democrats need to sit down and more strategically figure out 
okay, we won't run in this riding, riding X, and then you don't run in y, riding Y, and we won't run in riding Z, and you know, we'll have a kind of a non-aggression pact to figure these things out. Well, you know, that, uh, I just don't think that will happen uh, because we have such a powerful tradition in Ontario uh, with each of the political parties, now including the Greens, uh, having a full slate of candidates. And to uh, kind of negotiate around uh, being in one riding and not in another, it, it's, it, it's not part of our uh, electoral DNA. So I don't anticipate that. If, as uh, I'm hoping, uh, Ford does not get a majority, then both Andrea and Stephen have to sit down and say, now, what are we going to do about that? And that would not be a bad result. Uh, indeed, uh, if that happens, uh, I think they could work together to form a government a little bit like the government that we formed in 1985 when David Peterson became the premier. Uh, and uh, it, it may even involve NDP members and liberal members forming a cabinet together. But to say that down the road, we are not going to run candidates uh, where the other party has a strong candidate. It's just, it's not in the cards. I don't see it happening. Okay, Carolyn, let me and get your take on that. Yes, I'd love to jump in on that. I, I fundamentally disagree with the premise that uh, the purpose of opposition parties is to come together to defeat uh, an incumbent government. The point of a party is to put forward their values their I policy ideas and um, the notion that the NDP and the Liberal and the Greens are kind of one group that can defeat uh, uh, the PCs is, is just a false premise. I mean, we the Greens uh, stand for things that none of the three other parties stand for. And uh, our, our point is not to defeat the, the federal, uh, sorry, the Ford government, our, our raison d'être is to put forward the policies that we think Ontario desperately needs. Okay, John, let me ask you the question from the opposite end of the political spectrum, which is to say, you know, there are a bunch of new right-wing parties out there right now, which are obviously hoping to eat a bit of Doug Ford's lunch because the Ford government has moved, you know, we, we can argue about how much closer to the center they've moved, but they certainly aren't the radical right-wing disruptive populist party that they were four years ago. And you've got the Ontario Party and the New Blue Party and the Ontario First Party and the Libertarians out there trying to get votes, presumably that might have gone to Doug Ford had they not been there. Are you worried that they'll take too big a chunk of the electorate and deprive Ford of a majority? It doesn't look like it at this point. And, and you know, you got to be careful with, with measuring those things. The assumption that all of those votes would come at the expense of Doug Ford and the, and the Conservative Party is, you know, that doesn't always true up with reality. Uh, and I think any time a party that is centrist and that, you know, no matter where they're located on the scale, that's going to invite people to the left or the right of them to form parties and, and, and to campaign. That's all fair ball. They have a point of view and they want to express it and it's good. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be a particularly important part of, of the Ontario campaign. It may show up in a writing or two, but that's about it. I do think one of the things that we've seen different in this campaign than the last, say, 20 years is that the public sector unions have not been as effective at blowing up the Conservative Party before the election. So the Working Families Coalition, you know, the coalition of, of basically public sector unions, have had a record of spending an awful lot of money to blow up the Conservatives before the election. Kathleen Wynne changed some of the election laws, and that have, that's had a, a dampening effect mm -hmm. on that. And also, mm -hmm. those public sector unions don't seem as engaged this time around. So that's a very different dynamic going into this election as well. The yeah. clock has it's flown by here. So, yeah, I, I've only got 30 seconds left, forgive me. And I do want to put it to Greg Cerbera because I think all the pundits seem to be clear that Ford's going to win his seat, Horvath's going to win her seat, Schreiner's going to win his seat. They're not sure about Vaughn Woodbridge and Stephen Del Duca. Can you give us any insight on that, Greg? Uh, not really, although I've, I've been in the riding. I think the, the support for Stephen uh, uh, remains. He held the seat for a long time. He represented the people well. Uh, and I think uh, realizing that they, uh, they have the opportunity, if not to elect the next premier, to elect the leader of the opposition will carry uh, a good part of that vote in Vaughn Woodbridge. And uh, I'm hoping and I'm imagining that he is going to win that seat. Which used to be yours. 
which used to be mine, exactly. There you go. I want to thank John Snowblin and Francis Lankin, Greg Cerbera and Carolyn Pickett for coming onto the agenda tonight and having a bit of a walk down memory lane as we talk about election 43 as well. Be well, everybody, and thanks for this. Good night. Thanks, thank Stephen. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.